This is part eight in a series that I entitled Life Without God. Um, we've been making our way through different sections of the biblical book of Ecclesiastes. Um, and we took a two-week hiatus. Last week was table talk. Stacy and I were up here answering questions, talking about Ecclesiastes and things that I've preached on in Ecclesiastes. Um, and then the week before was Easter. So... Uh, so we've taken a two-week hiatus, but we're back, and it's just this week and next week. That's it. Two more Sundays uh, of this series, and I always get a little bit nervous when a series is ending because that means I have to come up with a new series. Um, so pray for me. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do yet. I should by now, but I don't. Um, but this morning, I want to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11. It's only 12 chapters. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and I want to focus on verses 7 through 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. The writer says this, Light is sweet. How pleasant to see a new day dawning. When people live to be very old, let them rejoice in every day of life. But let them also remember there will be many dark days. Everything still to come is meaningless. Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. So refuse to worry and keep your body healthy. But remember that youth with a whole life before you is meaningless. Encouraging words from the writer of Ecclesiastes. So as we've seen week after week, Ecclesiastes is a bold and honest, courageous look at the ways that we try to find happiness and meaning in life apart from God. Which is why I've said each week that the subtitle to Ecclesiastes could easily be The Search. Because the writer, and we're not exactly sure who that is, uh, some people say King Solomon, other people say that it was someone taking on a Solomonic persona. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the writer has been combing through life under the sun, looking for lasting happiness, for something to satisfy, for something, someone to fill voids, the voids that he feels. He's been searching high and low for meaning and purpose in things like wisdom and wealth, power and accomplishments, relationships and pleasure, winning and trying to control things. And he still hasn't found what he's looking for. So we get to chapter 11 and the search goes on. He keeps looking, he keeps examining, he keeps excavating life under the sun to try to find that missing piece of the puzzle that he feels but can't fully identify. And in these verses, the ones I just read, he addresses the vanity of trying to find ultimate meaning and purpose in our age and our stage in life. I think a lot about that these days. Um, I'm 51, and it seems like just yesterday I was 31. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit that aging has not been easy for me. Um, I struggle with it. I see pictures of myself from just 10 years ago, and I wonder what happened. Um, as I age, I realize just how much of my value and my significance came with youth. The energy I had, the ambition I had, the opportunities I had, my dreams, my youthful looks. Um, I mean, five or six years ago, when I would tell people that I was a grandfather, they would say, wow, you look way too young to be a grandfather. They don't say that anymore. They're like, oh, that's sweet. I'm like, wait a second, you're supposed to say. Um, I mean, for the first time in my life, cosmetic surgery is very understandable to me, okay? It's very plausible. Um, but when you're, when you're young, you don't, you don't think about getting old. You just don't. 
when you have your whole life ahead of you. And there's so much good in that. I mean, he says in verse 9, the first part of verse 9, young people, it's a wonderful thing to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. I mean, you and I both know that the, the blessings of, of youth are numerous. The stamina that we had, opportunities, ignorance of passing time. <laughs> Um, the newness of things, the excitement at seemingly endless possibilities, your whole life is ahead of you. Getting married, starting a family, becoming a parent, beginning your career, making your mark, dreaming about the mark you want to make, earning your own money, not being dependent on the people you had been dependent on for so long. There is an aliveness, an excitement, a rush in being young. If God gave me three wishes, okay, three wishes, after wishing for $5 billion, okay, um, but if God gave me three wishes, my wishes would be steeped in vanity, okay, I'm embarrassed to say. I would probably ask him to give me back 11 years of my life, put me at 40 years old, and then just keep me there for like 30 or 40 years. Um, that was a time in my life where I felt more alive than I had ever felt. I was at the top of my game professionally. Life seemed to be going exactly the way I had dreamed I wanted it to go. And then things happen. All of that changes. I loved being young. I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have because, as I said, when you're young, you don't think about getting old. But I, I loved it. Loved it. I loved the energy I had. <laughs> I loved the opportunities I had. I loved the dreams I had. I loved being a young dad to young kids. I loved it. Nothing but fond memories of being young. And some of you who are older than I am or looking at me without any sympathy whatsoever because you think I'm still young, and I appreciate that, but that's just because you're really old, okay? Um, uh, <laughs> some of you are really old. I'm just kidding, um, but, uh, but I'm feeling my age. I'm feeling it. Um, you see, the great, and I thought about this a lot yesterday as I was preparing, that the great and dangerous temptation of youth, and you don't realize it when you're young, but the great and dangerous temptation of youth is to put your happiness and your significance and your sense of purpose and worth and all those things that go along with being young. We don't realize it when it's happening, but when we're young, so much of our identity is anchored in things like our dreams, our ambitions, our youthful look, our youthful energy. We don't realize it. And that's why aging is so hard for so many people. Aging can usher in an identity crisis, either a big one or lots of small ones. And it's in those moments you begin to realize that I had anchored my identity in the things of youth, the newness of things. It's why a lot of people in midlife have serious crises because they're trying to recover a sense of what it felt like to be young. There was such an aliveness to it. Marriages end. People make some really stupid decisions in the middle of life because they're trying to go back and recover something that they once felt something that they once had. Um, I mean, I joke about cosmetic surgery, but my gosh, I mean, the cosmetic surgery industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Well, that tells us something. It tells us that we desperately want to be young again, stay young, feel young. Um, it's, it's hard. It, it, it shows us where we had previously placed our identity where our worth came from, where our sense of purpose came from, where our feeling alive came from. Um, 
It's not just, for instance, that your body doesn't look or feel the way it did. It's because you placed your identity in looking and feeling good. It's not just that your youthful dreams didn't pan out the way you had hoped. It's that you'd placed your identity in fulfilling those dreams. That's the real struggle, the under-the-surface struggle. In other words, it wasn't just a dream that you had. It was how you measured your worth. It was how you measured your value. Now, this was an unconscious exercise for all of us, for the most part. But that doesn't change the fact that it happened. We do this. We instinctively do this. We, we place our identity in things that are transient, things that are not permanent, things that fade. Um, I think the most paralyzing form of lostness that we experience under the sun is when our roles become our identity. And we do this. All the time we do this. For instance, many retired people I've talked to have described a profound lostness of meaning now that their career is over. For so long they had located their identity in the work they did and all that came with it. And now that their role has changed, they experience a late in life identity crisis. I remember being in California probably five years ago and preaching at a church and telling my story and how I underwent an identity crisis in my early 40s because of some stupid decisions I made and everything that I lost as a result and how that exposed to me the things that I had previously placed my identity in. And so now that those things were gone, I didn't know who I was, which is a very scary thing to feel in your 40s. And a guy came up to me after the service, probably early, mid-70s, very successful businessman. I had made a lot of money, had a lot of power, a lot of influence, and he had retired a few years earlier. And he came to me and he said, look, I, I can't relate to your specific circumstances because that wasn't my story, but I can certainly relate to the identity crisis that you talked about because I recently retired and here I am in my 70s and I don't know who I am without the work that I had devoted my life to. The office that I went to, the employees that worked for me, the business deals that I was a part of, now that all that's gone, I don't, I don't know who I am anymore. Um... I mean, uh, I also see this with parents when they become empty nesters. For so long, their identity was anchored in being a parent and taking care of the kids, but when the kids grow up and move away, they lose their sense of purpose. The parents do. They lose their sense of significance. They don't know who they are or even what to do. Their role had become their identity. So when your roles become your identity, you experience an identity crisis every time your roles change, every time. And that creates so much of the stress and the tension that we feel in life because life continues to move forward. Every new thing we gain typically means that we've lost something, we've moved past something, we've moved past a certain age, we've moved past a certain stage. I stood up here probably six weeks ago or so um, and talked about how difficult it has been um, for me just to see. I love the fact that my kids, my three kids are older and they're on their own and the relationship we have is so good. They're three of my very best friends, but that doesn't mean I don't desperately miss the days when they were small. Uh, that stage in life that time, those Christmas mornings that were so early and yet so energetic and exciting, birthdays, all of that stuff, um, I miss that. Um, in an article called The Perfectionist Trap, uh, a writer by the name of Josh Cohen wrote this. Something about being human, young or old, makes it difficult to feel that we have done or are enough. And we are unwilling to extinguish the hope that one day we will be recognized as exceptional. 
And Henry Nowen, a writer that I greatly admire and respect, who's now dead, uh, said something similar when he said this, all day long we hear loud voices that demand, prove you are worth something, do something relevant, spectacular, or powerful, then you will earn the love you so desire, the identity you crave. Striving plagues the young, and the old. Chasing after the wind is no respecter of age or stage in life. I think, as I mentioned just a minute ago, for me, the hardest part of aging is what I talked about, you know, six, four, five, six weeks ago, just the passing of time. We looked at that in Ecclesiastes 3. Uh, philosopher Peter Kreeft said, time is a river that takes from us everything it gives us. I feel that. I feel that acutely, more now than ever. I spend a lot of time these days reflecting, remembering, wishing I would have enjoyed more in the moments that I had. Thinking foolishly that this would last forever that these moments wouldn't pass. I spent so much time, like I said a minute ago, I loved the stage of my kids being young, but I remember spending time thinking about how much I was going to enjoy it when they were older, and I think there was a part of me that uh, missed out on what the moments had to offer because I was looking to the next moment, to the next thing, to the next season. I mean, I've always craved more than what I have, the next thing. I mean, this goes back to the time I was a kid. Um, I mean, I was always looking past the current moment to what the next moment might be or what the next, or what I want the next moment to be. When I got to college, I couldn't wait to get out of college and get to graduate school. When I was in graduate school, I couldn't wait to get out of graduate school to get on with my career. After I got my first job, I, I just couldn't stop thinking about what my next job was going to be. Um, all of that stuff. And when I became a pastor, I, I, wanted, I wanted this week's sermon to be better than last week's sermon. I, as an author, I wanted this book to be better than the last book. I was always chasing the wind. Speaking openly and honestly everywhere I went about the exhaustion of living on a performance treadmill while I was living on a performance treadmill. And I didn't, I didn't have the self-awareness back then to even really know what I was doing or why I was doing it. I was just sort of going through the motions. But loss and regret has a way of sobering you up making you more self-aware, making you think a little bit more deeply about what's under the surface of your life, under the surface of your heart and your desires. Um, and so I, I spend a lot of time these days reflecting, remembering, wishing. I live with regrets. We all do. Um, and, and even though I've learned a lot about slowing down and savoring the moment and not taking minutes for granted, time continues to pass and I can't stop it. I hate my birthdays now, <laughs> hate them. I used to love them when I was a kid. Um, but for some reason, just the, the passing of time and my inability to slow it down makes me sad these days. And it also scares me because I'm constantly asking myself, what am I missing? Am I missing out on something that I don't wanna be missing out on? I don't wanna make the same mistake twice. What should I be doing? How should I be spending my time? Is there any way to slow things down? Now, don't, don't get me wrong. There are many things I enjoy about getting older, many things. Um, I think I'm freer than I was when I was young. Uh, I have more perspective now. I have a lot more appreciation for small things than I used to have. I care about people more. I think I'm a better listener because I care about people more. I think I'm more reflective. I, I think I'm more self-aware. I know and have accepted my limitations in a way that I couldn't when I was young. That's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. I see more. I hear more. I feel more. Things are quieter inside of me. These days, I think I'm, I'm very prone to being distracted, but I think I'm less distracted now 
than I was when I was young. I'm not always looking past the current moment to the next moment. I'm appreciating moments so much more. I'm more content than I used to be. I think I'm more comfortable in my own skin. I'm not as concerned about wanting what I don't have as much as loving what I do have. And those kinds of deep changes only happen with age. And so I'm very grateful for so many things that God has developed and has allowed me to experience as I get older. But with perspective and self-awareness and reflection also comes pain. I've already given voice to some of it. The passing of time, the missing out on things that I wish I could go back to. Time wasted, opportunities missed, a growing catalog of regrets with self-awareness and perspective comes pain also. Because you see more, because you hear more, because you feel more, you experience more pain. Um, so while there are benefits to being young, there are also traps. Locating our identity, placing our worth and our value and our significance and all the things that accompany youth. And while there are benefits to getting older, lots of them, there is also pain. Not just physically. Yeah, our bodies start changing and hurting and shutting down in a variety of ways. We become more physically aware of the things that we can't do the way we used to do. But that's sort of surface pain. It's the under-the-surface pain of getting older that I mentioned a minute ago. Just this a growing awareness of regrets, a reflection, a looking back over the years that you've been alive and wondering if you missed something, looking back at mistakes you made and wishing you could go back in time and fix those things, and you can't. None of us can. Um, so there are great benefits to being young. There are also traps and temptations. And there are great benefits to getting older, but there is also pain. And this is the point that the writer is making in these verses. This is precisely the point that he's making in verses 7 through 10. He's saying, youth is good, enjoy it, but don't let it define you. If you let it define you, then as you age, you are going to suffer even more. You're going to stand face to face with a long list of identity crises. I don't think I said that right. You're going to look down the you're going to look down the tunnel and just face identity crisis after identity crisis. So enjoy your youth, but don't let it define you. That's what he's saying. And then he also says, getting older does some good things for you. It develops you in ways that only aging can, but it also comes with pain. And just to put an exclamation point on everything he said, death awaits us all, young and old. That's why he says to the old and to the young in these verses that everything is meaningless because in the end, we all die. And if there is no God and, and, and we experience life without God, then death is the end for all of us. And that's where we're all headed. Death claims 100% of the human race. Um, so that's the point that he's making. So once again, the writer concludes that everything and everyone in this world will fail you. In some way, and at some point, relying on an achievement, an experience, a person, a particular way that you feel, anything under the sun to be our ultimate source of meaning and purpose and identity is like building a house on the sand. He says over and over, it's like chasing after the wind, a type of treadmill existence that never really gets us anywhere, but it does get us tired. Thomas Merton, the American monk, may have been channeling Ecclesiastes when he pointed out that we may spend our whole life climbing the ladder only to find when we get to the top that our ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. He may have been thinking about Ecclesiastes, maybe not. 
And I've often wondered if, if Shakespeare was meditating on Ecclesiastes when he wrote these lines from Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. At least he's honest. An accurate description of life without God. So I'll try to put it even more plainly than Shakespeare and Thomas Merton. Apart from God, life is ultimately meaningless and hopeless. And once we realize this, once we have the courage to realize this, once we have the courage to acknowledge this, to admit this, it brings us to a place of despair where we are finally ready to hear good news. It brings us to our knees to a place where we are finally ready to hear the gospel. I shared with the guys on Thursday night at the vault that Paul Zoll, my good friend, uh, told me in a time of severe crisis that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. We're not, it doesn't matter what someone says, the wisdom that someone may give us, the information that we get, if we're not ready to receive it, we will never hear it. It won't make any difference. So he said, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And Ecclesiastes makes us ready for the teacher. Gets us there. It gets us ready to hear what we so desperately need to hear. We need some good news. In this world of bad news, in my life that is chock full of bad news, I need some good news and I can't find it inside and I can't find it in life under the sun. I need something from above the sun to give me hope. Something lasting, something eternal, something permanent. Not the transient stuff that I float from here in life under the sun. And the good news is that ultimate hope and peace and security and meaning comes from God, our creator who wired us, created us to experience the beauty of things like purpose and meaning and value and love from nothing smaller than him. He created us. It's why St. Augustine said in his famous prayer that you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. We search high and low. And Blaise Pascal echoed that when he said that we have a God-shaped void in our soul that only God is big enough to fill. And we spend our lives trying to fill it to no avail to no avail. So all of the things we long for in the deepest part of our being, the, the hope, peace, security, meaning that we crave comes from God, not anything we do or anything we can become. It comes from God's love for us. It comes from God's approval of us. It comes from God's friendship to us, no matter what. His delight in us, no matter what. It's God's grace and mercy and forgiveness that gives us a reason to live and a reason to laugh, a reason to not take ourselves so seriously because we have nothing to prove. We have nothing to protect. We belong to God. Our creator defines us with his love, his acceptance. He doesn't wait for us to clean ourselves up and make ourselves acceptable before he welcomes us. It's his welcome of us that makes us acceptable. It's not our achievements or our failures, our wisdom or our foolishness, our abilities or our weaknesses, our regrets or our proudest moments that define us. God defines us. And his definition for us is singular, beloved. 
you're mine. You belong to me. Whatever you experience, whatever you do, the highs, the lows, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the, the strengths and the struggles, all of that stuff, you're mine. I don't welcome you and love you based on what you do, who you can become, or what you fail to do, or anything like that. It's not conditional. It's unconditional. And that is an incredibly difficult thing to believe. It is for me. It, it's much easier for me, for instance, to say that God loves sinful people than it is for me to say God loves me. Much easier to be generic about this stuff because we live in this conditional world. And so the whole notion of unconditionality is literally otherworldly. It, it goes against the grain of any logic that we may have regarding how things are supposed to work in this world. So if you're tired, like I am, of trying to make it on your own, tired of searching but never finding, tired of solutions that make your emptiness emptier, then stop chasing the wind. It's more tempting to do that when you're young than when you're old because you just get tired as you age. But that doesn't mean that we stop chasing after the wind even as we age in a different way maybe. But unlike the uncatchable wind that we chase, the wind of God's grace chases us. It catches us and it whispers to us, there's no need to chase any longer. What you've been chasing, what you've been searching for has found you. So relax, breathe, live, laugh. It is finished, full stop. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your mercies, which are new every morning. Where would any of us be without them? We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.